Frank Giantomasi. I'm one of the co-chairs of this endeavor. I was asked by the county executive, Joseph DiVincenzo, to uh, <clears throat> take this opportunity to say it's a great day in Newark, it's a great day in Essex County, and it's a great day to uh, participate in this fine dedication. Uh, we have a uh, program that's going to move pretty quickly. It's going to be very interesting, and we have some wonderful speakers who are going to enlighten you as to this project and as to Justice Brennan's history and his position in our national history. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask everyone to rise, and I have a 10th grade student from Barringer High School, Shah Asia Jones, who's going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would you all please remain standing? At this time, thank you, Sean. At this time, we're going to have the um, Irish National Anthem sung by a retired Newark firefighter, James Mooney, and that will be immediately followed by our Star Spangled Banner uh, sung by Mark Beckett, a performing arts teacher at our own Essex County uh, Vocational School in West Caldwell. So please remain standing. James? I'll sing you a song, a soldier's song, in cheering, rousing chorus, as round the blazing fires we throng the starry heavens o'er us, impatient for the coming fight, and as we wait the morning's light, here in the silence of the night, we will chant the soldier's song. Soldiers are we, whose lives are pledged to our land. Some have come from the land beyond the wave, sworn to be free. No more our ancient sire land shall shelter the despot or the slave. Tonight we rest upon a wail in Aaron's cause come woe or wail. Midst cannons roar and rifles peal, we will chant the soldier's song. Thank you. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for oh, the land of the free and the hope of the brave. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, Mark. Now, please remain standing, and I'd like to bring you all uh, to the attention of Father Ed Leahy, the headmaster at St. Benedict's Prep, for our invocation. Father? I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to my neighborhood. I live right across the street. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our Lord, we're grateful today for this day, for the opportunity to be present here together grateful for the intellect and for the heart of Justice Brennan, for the vision of our county executive and the Board of Chosen Freeholders. We 
ask uh, the intercession of Justice Brennan before your throne of mercy today that the decisions made here by those entrusted with the interpretation of the law may always be uh, for the common good. Bless all of us in our endeavors and allow us traveling mercy that we may arrive to our homes this evening safely. We make our prayer as always in your name. Let all in accord say amen. amen. Thank you, Father. Please have a seat. It's a warm day, but a great day, as I said before. At this time, we have some representatives of government that want to address you in a, in a brief fashion. And we're going to have Lonnie Watson, our president of the Board of Freeholders. Come on up, Lonnie who will then introduce our great mayor, Cory Booker. Thank you, and good afternoon. First, if you would just allow me to introduce the Board of Chosen Freeholders. We have with us uh, this afternoon, Freeholder Siebold, Pat Siebold. We have with us Vice President Rav Caputo, and we have with us Freeholder Kavanaugh. Thank you, Freeholders, for being with us uh, this afternoon. And I am honored to express uh, my brief remarks as we honor and celebrate the life of Justice William J. Brennan, uh, Jr. Today we make history as we unveil the memorial statue at the government complex. As we unveil this monument that stands on this hall of, hall of records, let me commend the county executive for his selection to place this monument and on a building that houses every department that in some way touches the lives of our Essex County residents. Justice Brennan fight for all mankind, freedom for want of fear was so much a part of Justice Brennan's ideas. His ideals that freedom inspires and promotes brotherhood, ensures peace, and bring a glimmer of sunlight into the souls of mankind. Joe, in closing, I should like to paraphrase the words of the great Abraham Lincoln, who in, memor in a memorial address said, the world will litter, will little note, nor long remember what we say here today, but it can never forget what we did here today. Thank you, and may God bless you. I have, I have the distinct honor and pleasure to introduce my mayor, who has been with us for four years, who has done great things in the city of Newark, and is now a, a part of Essex County like we've never been before, the city of Newark and Essex County coming together to make things happen in this great city and in our county. And at this time, I'd like to introduce to you the mayor of Newark, New Jersey, our own Mayor Cory Booker. We all know the saying that it takes a village to raise a child. But here in Newark, here in Essex County, we don't simply raise children. We raise educators and teachers. We raise firefighters. We raise police officers. We raise ambulance drivers. <laughs> we raise men and women who lead, who dream, who aspire, who accomplish, who push our nation forward, who change humanity. The city in its 300 plus years has given birth to many children who have, thanks to the efforts of thousands who were there for them, who coached them, who mentored them, who looked after them on the block, ascended to excellence and great contribution. Today, we honor one of our children, a scion of this city, who indeed was raised here, who was elevated to the highest heights of our judicial system, and from that post made contributions that will live as long as our country breathes. Today, we give reverence for his excellence. We give reverence to his love. We give thanks for his very being. And in this honor today that we bestow upon his memory, let us continue the dedication that we will be a city that just, just does not love its children, but elevates them to continued levels of excellence. May his memory, may this unveiling inspire us all 
to do what is necessary to continue the advancement of this nation and make it indeed a more perfect union. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Booker. Uh, anecdotally, my, my father, who was born in 1903, told me about when Teddy Roosevelt took the train from Washington, D.C. to cut the ribbon for our great historic courthouse here because it was of national importance and Teddy Roosevelt wanted to be here and it became a model for our Supreme Court in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Well, this event today is, is just as important from a federal and a state level. Um, at this point in time, uh, representing the United States Post Office, I'm going to introduce you to Carol Pierce, who's our manager, who's going to explain to you that this year, in addition to being inducted into the, uh, to the New Jersey Hall of Fame, a commemorative stamp has been dedicated to Justice Brennan, um, as well as in September, uh, the first authorized biography of Justice Brennan will come out, and we have the author, Seth, is over here taking notes. So at this time, on behalf of the federal government, the United States Post Office, Thank you and good afternoon. It's an honor for the United States Postal Service to be part of this wonderful occasion honoring Justice William Brennan. The Postal Service special second day unveiling reintroduces one of the justices of the Supreme Court commemorative stamps. And how appropriate that his legacy would be connected and remembered here atop this magnificent Hall of Records building in the city of Newark, his birthplace. I am happy to be uh, representing the Postal Service at this event. In 2009, a dedicated, we dedicated a stamp in honor of this American icon, who many believe was one of the nation's leaders in shaping our constitutional law. The stamp that was selected is both historical and educational. The backdrop for his image is the Supreme Court building located in Washington, D.C. And I ask you to really look at it because, you know, first we see the person, and it's amazing that you also see what he, he represented it and he worked for for so many years. The stamp captures the essence of what Brennan contributed to this nation. I speak to you today not only to celebrate the composition and dedication of his monument, but to also paint a picture of what he stands for to the United States Postal Service. Mr. Brennan was the author of numerous landmark decisions and the inspiration behind many others. Ladies and gentlemen, you too have the opportunity to make a difference. One step is to keep William Brennan's legacy and brilliance alive and take part in the Postal Service nationwide celebration through stamps. Take the time to appreciate history and honor this great teacher, leader, and legal icon. With the Supreme Justice Souvenir Stamps, we hope to give you a head start. So now, on behalf of the United States Postal Service, I would like to ask today's honored guests to join me at the drape as we reintroduce and honor William Brennan's through postage stamps. We also want to dedicate this postal artwork to the Essex County Hall of Records. Thank you so much. Uh, the story of Justice Brennan is a, uh, in, in its very quick synopsis form, is an immigrant son 
public school educated in Newark, University of Pennsylvania College, and then Harvard Law School. I know Cory Booker, you want me to mention Yale, just equal billing, so I did say Yale, as you asked me to say. Um, so, so what do we want to do at this moment? At this moment, we want everyone to uh, stand, uh, not stand, but just to recognize that, that we have public school education here today. I'm a pro product of the, of the Newark Public Schools, graduate of Eastside High School. Joe DiVincenzo is a gra graduate of Barringer. Uh, Justice Brennan was a graduate of Bar Barringer. And at this moment, please, everyone, let's have a round of applause. We have Barringer High School students here. Barringer Ninth Grade Success Academy is here. Essex County's North 13th Street School Law and Public Safety Academy is here. And we have the Harriet Tubman School here, and you're going to hear from their musical expertise later on. It's a great story. Again, in addition, it's not just about public education, it's not just about Newark, it's about immigrant, a child of, of immigrant parents, first generation. We're honored today, uh, representing the government of Ireland, uh, we have uh, with us today Brandon O'Quilly, who is the Deputy Counsel General from the Republic of Ireland. He's going to address us at this moment. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and as Frank was saying, uh, Justice Brennan's story is essentially that of an immigrant, and this is a country of immigrants, and it's a country where people have come from poverty and oppression in their homelands and have come here. And Justice Brennan is very much an example of that. His parents came from Roscommon in County, Ar uh, County Roscommon in Ireland, and Roscommon, 50 years before he was born, and perhaps during his parents' lifetime, I don't know, but certainly they would have been born into an Ireland who had just been devastated by the greatest humanitarian tragedy that happened in the 19th century the great famine, the hunger that devastated the Irish population. And if it was not for the United States, and if it was not for states like New Jersey and for cities like Newark, the Irish tragedy would have been multiplied many, many times over. The Irish came here as many immigrants before and many, many more since, and they got a home, a new home, and a new opportunity to be members of the fire department and uh, ambulance services, as the mayor rightly pointed out. But they got an opportunity here that was denied them at home. And that's the great thing about the United States and the example, the crystal clear example of Justice Brennan, that he got an opportunity. His parents came here. His father worked uh, blue collar jobs. He uh, ro rose to high office here in this great city. He contributed to this great city. And so many, if I can say, great Irish men and women have contributed, like Governor Brendan Byrne and all the other Irish men and women who have contributed to the development of this city and state. And I'm very proud and honored to stand on the shoulders of those great men and those great women, and on behalf of them, if I can presume to say this, to thank the city of New York, to er, New York, New Newark, and to thank the mayor of Newark, and to thank the Essex County, uh, and, and all those who contributed to making the success of the Irish here. And I hope in turn that other minorities and other excluded groups will learn from the Irish experience that this is a land of opportunity, and we are grateful for that. And Justice Brennan is a shining example of what can be achieved. So thank you very much, Newark, for remembering the son of Ireland, and uh, thank you again for well, giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, you've heard from municipal authorities, you've heard from federal authorities, you've heard from county, and uh, on behalf of the state of New Jersey, we have a, uh, a problem today because the legislature is sitting and we're all in the budget time, and uh, we couldn't have Sheila Oliver, our great speaker, with us, uh, but we have better than Sheila Oliver. We have a great governor who led this state for eight years through turmoil and kept the, uh, the even hand at the keel of the rudder of New Jersey. Brendan Byrne representing the state of New Jersey, former governor. Thank you very much. Thank you all. First of all, let me greet the uh, Brennans because I think we're related. We're, we're all from County Ross Common and at the same time. Anyway, uh, I wanted to say that. I just want to say one thing about uh, Justice Brennan, and that is that when I became governor in 1974, I went to see him in Washington, and I offered him his old seat on the New Jersey Supreme Court back. I thought, frankly, it was a better deal uh, for him. And I needed his help because I had an education bill and a tax that I wanted to get through, and I thought he could help. He thought about it for hopefully as long as this speech is going to be, and, and turned it down. But his 
his philosophy and his thought and his spirit guided us uh, through my years and was very helpful, guided us and continues to guide us despite everything. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, so this is also a story today about a, uh, a judge that was picked by, uh, by a president to leave Essex County and go to Washington. And why we selected this spot for the monument was because uh, this is the building when Justice Brennan sat in the appellate division. He sat actually in the Hall of Records and heard his cases here. County Executive Joe DiVincenzo thought that the most appropriate and fitting spot would be on the steps so that as people come up, they, they see this dedication to the man that he was. Uh, we're honored today because we have the highest representative of the judiciary in New Jersey joining us. And at this time, I'd like you all to please welcome uh, the great Justice, Chief Justice Stuart Ratner. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. We've had a number of recent gatherings here in Essex County that have marked special events in the life of our court system and the history of the judiciary. The appellate chambers that are now newly returned to Newark, the sitting of the Supreme Court here earlier this year, the magnificent historic courthouse that's been restored across the way, and others. And today's dedication of the statue in memory and in honor of Justice Brennan keep within that pattern in a beautiful way. There is a lot to be said about the extraordinary life and contributions to the law by Justice Brennan, and few are better able to speak to that, I think, than today's keynote speaker, Professor Tribe. So I thought with your permission, and hopefully with the help of the emergency vehicles out there, I might take a couple of minutes to speak about Professor Tribe, one of the most influential legal thinkers, constitutional scholars, and practitioners of the modern era. And as I say that, I'll confess to you that I get a little bit nervous because I find myself thinking back to a time that I sat in his class for a year, his popular con law class, my second year in law school. I am certain I said nothing that was noteworthy enough for him to remember 26 years later after so many thousands of students. But I remember well his gift as a teacher. I remember in particular one class where we were batting around a, a case critically analyzing a case by the Supreme Court over the course of the entire class until finally a student at the end of the session raised a hand and asked Professor Tribe what he would have written had he had the chance to write the majority opinion. The class got pretty quiet. That's, a, that's an unusual question for someone to ask to put the professor on the spot in that way. Professor Tribe paused, spent less than a moment thinking about it, and then recited off the top of his head what amounted to a perfect three-paragraph opinion from the Supreme Court um, brilliantly dealing with the legal issues in a persuasive and organized way and using perfect sentence structure and grammar as he fashioned this opinion as well. Um, when you finish, you can hear a pin drop in the room, not just from watching these legal theories come together, but watching a master craftsperson uh, mold an opinion in front of our eyes. Uh, I, I can say now with confidence uh, that that's not something easy to do as I've struggled for the last few years myself trying to craft some opinions. We have read about Professor Tribe's ongoing efforts, which I know Justice Brennan would wholeheartedly endorse as Senior Counselor for Access to Justice in the Department of Justice, working to improve and strengthen our courts, in particular for those who don't have the resources to hire counsel when they desperately need it. And there are a lot of issues that fall under that important umbrella that we strive to work toward achieving here in New Jersey each day. We have an ombudsman program here in the Essex County Courthouse and in all courthouses throughout the state where there's a point person that people who are unrepresented or underrepresented can go and speak with and get guidance about the procedures and the processes to follow to obtain justice. We have do-it-yourself kits and manuals. You can get up on the judiciary's website and find dozens of them covering a variety of legal areas, which once again help break down barriers. We have a staff of 60 interpreters and freelance professionals that we turned to who translated 87,000 court hearings last year into 81 languages and signing. I mentioned these few projects to leave off with an open invitation for Professor Tribe, and that is that if there are ways the New Jersey judiciary can assist in your ongoing efforts to strengthen and enhance access to justice, whether it's some form of partnership here in Essex County in a courthouse where Justice Brennan uh, was born in the city where he was born or some other form of partnership, we welcome and embrace that opportunity the judiciary is so delighted 
with the work here at the Courthouse Complex, thanks to the County Executive and his staff, and delighted that you've been able to attract Professor Tribe here today. Um, Professor, we all welcome you. Thank you. Thank you, Justice. As you can see, uh, after Guy Sterling presented this idea to Joe DiVincenzo, it became a multifaceted project. And uh, the committee that was formed included law firms like Nancy Smith and her husband, Neil Mullen. Uh, it included organizations like the Asian Pacific Bar Association, the Essex County Bar Association, the New, New Jersey State Bar Association. And all the funds for this event and all the funds for this statute were generated privately. This is not a drain on our budget, it's not a drain on the coffers, this isn't going to cost our citizens any money. And that will show you the dedication and the excitement as the private sector came forward to help support this. At this time, um, I'd like to bring to you also someone who came forward, and that's Dennis uh, LaFiora, and he's a uh, managing partner at the Day Pitney Firm. The importance of the Day Pitney Firm is that it formerly was known as Pitney Harden and Kip in New Jersey. We have former federal judge Jack Bissell, I saw him earlier, He's here, and he was a colleague of Justice Brennan. Uh, and uh, the Day Pitney firm is the successor firm uh, that uh, has helped financially dramatically. Dennis? Thank you. On behalf of the firm, uh, Day Pitney, I'd like to express how, uh, how pleased we are that we were able to support the completion of this tribute to Justice Brennan and how uh, proud we are of our relationship uh, with Justice Brennan. Uh, you may know that when he graduated from Harvard Law School in 1931, he came back to Newark and joined our firm, which was then called uh, Pitney, Harden, and Skinner. Uh, he became a partner in the firm in 1937. In 1942, he left the firm uh, to go back to, uh, to join the Army. He came back in 1945, and it was then the firm was renamed uh, Pitney, Harden, Ward, and Brennan. Uh, and he stayed with the firm until 1949, at which point he left the, ben uh, left the firm to go on the state bench and then eventually on to, as you know, the United States Supreme Court. Um, a few years ago, one of our partners, our senior partners, was retiring. Um, and uh, there are obviously a lot of lawyers here, and I, I think they probably will appreciate that partners who retire are much like parents who downsize. They believe that you desperately want everything that they manage to accumulate over the course of their careers. And this retiring partner brought to me um, a, a, a basket full of a variety of things. But in there uh, were a series of very old documents, uh, some of them dating as far back as 1919. And within those documents, there were four or five of them that dealt specifically with Justice Brennan. Uh, and I actually got them out, because uh, I thought some of them you might find interesting. Um, there is a sheet from 1934 which lists associates and their salaries. And it reflects that Justice Brennan, in 1934, earned $165 a week. I didn't convert that to $2,010. But the interesting part of this is it also shows that he got a raise for 1935 of $85 which, if you do the math, is, math, is a 53% raise. Not likely to happen anytime soon again. There is a, uh, a sheet which shows partner compensation for four or five years. The interesting thing about this sheet is that it shows that when Justice Brennan became a partner, he actually experienced a decrease in his compensation, something that we all can appreciate. Then there is the, his letter of resignation from the firm when he joined the war in 1942, when he joined the War Department, I'm sorry, in 1942, with his original signature. And the last one I will show, which is actually one of my favorites, is the memorandum of agreement between Justice Brennan and the firm when he resigned to go onto the bench. And it reflects that they determined uh, what his interest in the firm was going to be, or was, rather, and paid it out and it reflects the payment of $27,500. And then my favorite is that there is an addendum uh, dated about a week later, uh, signed by Waldron Ward and also by Justice Brennan, that, it, that recites the fact that there was, uh, the earlier document was admittedly erroneous um, and reflects the payment of an additional $4,000. Uh, in the interest of not having these documents sit in a file for another 70 years, um, I thought it might be fitting in closing to offer these to, to, to uh, Justice Brennan's daughter, Nancy Brennan, uh, so that you may keep them. Thank you very much.
Dennis, it's funny. Uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. When I became uh, Angelo Ginola's partner two months ago, he told me that I would get $165 a week too. So I, I guess I'm on my way to something big. Um, at this point in time, we want to bring you the great public school children of Harriet Tubman to give us a brief musical interview. Maestro.
Come on, that was great. Let's give him another round of applause, huh? They're young kids and it's hot. You know, I was just thinking, Ralph Caputa, Ralph Caputa, I was just thinking it's really hot, you know, and I was thinking how nice on a winter's day it would be to have another hot day like this, right? No. I'll come and see it to La Sicilia and Belgium. Thank you, Ralph. Your treat. Um, well, we've heard from all the different aspects. Um, we, we're graced by the family that's here today, and we're so, uh, so appreciative of all the efforts that our county executive made to make this possible. But the, uh, the germ of the thought came from a former Star Ledger reporter who Joe DiVincenzo has dubbed the, the, uh, the historian of Essex County. And at this point in time, I, I really want to bring you the, uh, the original seed of genius that created this, the man who, uh, who dreamed up the idea, and then Joe took it and ran with it like a, with a full head of steam. And that's our own Guy Sterling. Thank you, Frank. And thank everyone, and welcome to the Newark on this historic day. A few quick acknowledgments before I add my two cents to the mix. The, sculpt, uh, the sculptor Jay Warren is here. Jay is a former New Jersey resident who has pieces all over the country. He's an absolutely first-rate artist and was a joy to work with him, and I know I speak for everyone associated with this project when I say that. Jay? Probably under the tent. Seth Stern is also here. Seth is a co-author of the authorized biography of Justice Brennan that's coming out this fall. He's going to be back in Newark in the fall for both the program at Justice Brennan's Life and a book signing. Uh, that'll be probably the second or third week in October, so I want to bring that to everyone's attention to come to that. That'll be a program sponsored by the Newark History Society. I believe Tim Christ is here. He's uh, the president of the, of the society, and he does a great job in helping preserve Newark's history. I also want to acknowledge Tom Giblin, Steve Adubato Sr., and Nancy Smith, all members of the Statues Planning Committee and ma major contrib contributors to the project. We thank you for your interest and your effort. Tom DePoto of the Star Ledger, thank you for your endorsement of this project. When it was still in the planning stages, your editorial gave us traction. I'd also like to acknowledge my father, who's here, Bob Sterling, born and raised in Newark, a Westside High School and Panzer College graduate. He doesn't like me giving out his age, and I won't. But as a boy growing up in Newark, he remembers sneaking in to political rallies that Justice Brennan's father held at Plunkett's Florist on South Orange Avenue to grab a bite to eat from the food table before things got rolling. Dad, thanks for coming. And of course, my partners in this project, Frank and Joe, each one a native of Newark and close personal friends of mine for many years. Let me tell you briefly about the genesis of this project and then what I hope it means. Last year, in the weeks after I retired from the Star Ledger, I met with Joe in his office to tell him that there had been one of those 18 and a half, infamous 18 and a half minute gaps in Newark's collective consciousness that needed to be addressed. Though in this instance, it was more like 18 and a half years the time it had been since Justice Brennan left the Supreme Court. And like that earlier gap in Washington during the Watergate era, there was no explanation for the one here. I kept asking myself, how, some, how could someone of Justice Brennan's stature and enormous contribution to the lives of all Americans be forgotten in his hometown? After all, there are busts and portraits of him throughout the country, as well as awards buildings, lectures, and professorships named in his honor everywhere else. It troubled me for the longest time, and those who know me well will tell you how often I spoke of my concern. To his eternal credit, and after listening to me make my case that spring day, Joe took it under advisement and did his due diligence. I didn't know where things were headed until I ran into him in the street a few weeks later, and he said to me, with that boyish grin spread across his face, and his fist pumping, Justice Brennan, we're gonna do it. But he laid down two rules. All the money had to be raised privately, and the project had to be done fast because he, experience had taught him that if it wasn't, it might linger for years. That brings us to today. 
Ten months and more than $100,000 later, we're finally making certain that the great justice of our time, William J. Brennan Jr., will be remembered in the place where he got his life, start in life and the law, and the place that meant so much to him and his family. Contributions ranged from $5 to $15,000, and they came in from all over the country. We picked this spot for the statue's installation because Justice Brennan served in the building behind us when he sat as a state appeals court judge in New Jersey. But there's another significance to the tie-in with this location. The, hill, the building behind you, the Essex County Historic Courthouse, the one the statue will be facing, was designed by Cass Gilbert, the same architect who designed the Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C., where Justice Brennan served so brilliantly for 34 years during a tumultuous time in American history. So this place seemed like the perfect spot for the statue with links to both Justice Brennan's state court service and federal court service. My hopes for this statue are simple. I hope it will lead to a renewed interest in Justice Brennan in Newark. I'm all but certain it will, just from the reaction that people who happen to be walking by and stopped to ask questions the other day when the statue was being installed. Newark needs to be as big a booster of Justice Brennan as he was of Newark, and that relationship begins with a better knowledge here of his life, his career, his work, and his work's impact. There are two major law schools in this town, and I pray one or both will pick up the ball on this. I also hope the statue will serve as a reminder to all those judges and attorneys who enter this court complex each day that they have the highest standard of integrity and service to the law to live up to in carrying out their duties. Additionally, I hope it will signify to the members of the public who come here too, whether as plaintiffs, defendants, witnesses, jurors, or spectators, that they not only will be treated justly and fairly, but humanely. I hope the statue will inspire the children who pass this way, particularly those from immigrant families like Justice Brennan's who may not have it so easy, and help them understand that keeping their hearts pure, their hands clean, and their noses to the grindstone does pay off. But most of all, I hope it will serve as a symbol to all those with a connection to this remarkably resilient city of ours, a symbol of just how important a role Newark has played in American history, a symbol in restoring civic pride in who we are as a people and what we've achieved, a symbol that putting aside our natural differences as citizens from different backgrounds and persuasions and working in the best interest of everyone as human beings will help make us great again. I know of no certain formula for returning to Newark to the preeminence it once enjoyed but I am convinced that understanding how it became one of America's great urban centers of the first half of the 20th century and studying the lives of Newarkers from that era who truly made a difference in this world can serve as important guideposts along the road back to national prominence and leadership. For Justice Brennan was not just from Newark, he was a product of Newark. There's a lesson to be learned, learned from this and we owe it to ourselves to take it seriously. Thank you all for making this day possible. God bless you, God bless Justice Brennan and his family, and God bless our wonderful city. Well, we come to the moment of our, our keynote address, and we are so honored to have uh, Professor Tribe here from Harvard Law School and from Washington. Uh, briefly, uh, Professor Tribe, uh, born in Shanghai, came to America as a young man, um, educated in California, um, clerked in the Supreme Court of California, then clerked uh, for Potter Stewart in the Supreme Court of the United States of America. He's gone on to argue over 35 Supreme Court cases uh, before our great uh, body of jurists there. Uh, been a professor to uh, Justice Rabner and uh, Barack Obama and other notable figures uh, such as this and is recognized without peer as the preeminent constitutional scholar on the United States of America's constitution topic. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I think we should all stand and uh, be in revere of a great man who's come to Newark today of his own volition to dedicate this section with Joe DiMaggio.